Good morning, everybody. Thank you for everyone uh, who's here at Vox Media Headquarters in Washington, D.C., and for all of you who are viewing our live stream at TheVerge.com or FCC.gov. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. My name is Jim Bankoff, and I'm the chairman and CEO of Vox Media. We're publishers of sites like SB Nation, The Verge, and soon Polygon. Um, it's a great honor for us to host Chairman Julius Jenikowski of the FCC this morning, who will be making a, a major policy speech. Uh, and we're honored to have him here and honored that all of you have uh, attended as well. Without further ado, I'm going to run a quick video that will explain a little bit about Vox Media. I recognize it might, we might be a new company and a new face for a lot of you. So we're going to show a quick buzz clip and hopefully get everyone's blood flowing and explain the company a little bit. I'm Josh Topolsky. Welcome to On The Verge. Welcome back to SB Nation. Russ Prostick here with Polygon. Integrated Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. We're looking at the best stylized for your iPad. This is really cool. We're in the Microsoft model shop. Every year you have a chance to own the New York Yankees in horse racing. A bunch of protesters stand behind me. I wanted to be here today to document it all. We are a couple weeks out from the release of Max Payne 3. We've been hiring a lot of different people with a lot of different experience from different parts of the industry. No, nope, you move. Stop. What do you want? Stop. <laughs> Just don't move your f***ing hands. <laughs> We're going to learn how to become driving ninjas. The internet is the dream platform for scammers. It is the first free-to-play shooter on the console, right? Yes, indeed. That's pretty incredible. Every game of the World Series, I use drugs. It's one of the best feelings ever to walk out on a Sunday, uh, thousands of people screaming. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Thanks. So that gives a little, thank you, that gives a little overview of who we are as Vox Media. And what you can see from the video, and if you check out our websites, is that we are a digitally native, web native company. And that's why it's so appropriate and we're so honored to host this session. Our company would not exist without broadband. It's not just the media that we create, but it's the infrastructure that runs our company. It enables our 200 plus employees and 1,000 plus paid contributors all of which, by the way, are jobs that were created in the past four years, and all of which were created by broadband. So we take this issue very seriously, and uh, this, this address is therefore very appropriate. Chairman Janikowski and I met in 2007. I, I had recently left my job at AOL, and he was beginning the next chapter of his career following a very successful tenure as an internet executive and investor. We were both ready to embark on the next phase of our careers as digital entrepreneurs, but we shared a problem that was common to a lot of early stagers. We didn't have an office. Um, the chairman took matters into his own hands and uh, got a place, and quickly he became my landlord. Uh, we <laughs> subleased the space down in Chinatown. And um, while, while Julius was setting up LaunchBox, which is an incubator focused on helping early stage companies to reach their full potential, I started working on what was then SB Nation and has now become Vox Media. As office mates, our friendship grew. We spent many hours talking about the vast potential of consumer and enterprise businesses that were being enabled by broadband. And we also talked a lot about baseball. Soon Julius had been appointed to lead the FCC. Those of us who understood the opportunities for the United States brought on by the massive transformation in broadband and communications were thrilled to have a chairman who was not only an accomplished legal scholar, public servant, and corporate executive, but someone who had also innovated and created jobs at the grassroots level. As we awaited confirmation, the then chairman-elect continued to share an office with us. Of course, we were growing, as was his staff, and it's a proud part of Vox Media's heritage and history that we have to compete for a conference room space with the future FCC leadership. <laughs> Fast forward to today. SB Nation has morphed into Vox Media. We've grown from one full-time employee, our founder, Tyler Blazinski, 
to 200 full-time employees and over 1,000 paid freelancers, all within the past four years. Our media properties like The Verge, SB Nation, and soon to launch Polygon reach over 30 million visitors each month. And in fact, literally just a few minutes ago, we launched our most ambitious upgrade in our history with a bold new SB Nation platform that is optimized for the post-PC era of smartphones and tablets. Check it out, little plug, sbnation.com. Chairman Janikowski is leading the FCC and America's broadband roadmap. And my New York Yankees and Julius's Washington Nationals are both in first place in their respective divisions. So not too shabby in the past four years. Since being sworn in as chairman of the FCC in June 2009, Chairman Janikowski has focused the agency on unleashing the opportunities of wired and wireless broadband. He has successfully pursued policies to promote investment and job creation, drive innovation, foster competition, and empower consumers. During his tenure, the FCC developed and is implementing the National Broadband Plan, an ambitious strategy to harness the opportunities of high-speed internet, promote U.S. global competitiveness, and bring the benefits of 21st century communications to all Americans. The Commission has worked to modernize outdated programs and eliminate barriers to innovation and investment. The Commission adopted the landmark Connect America Fund, a once-in-a-generation overhaul of the multi-billion dollar Universal Service Fund and its related rules, transforming it from supporting telephone service to broadband. The Connect America Fund replaces legacy programs with new market-driven, incentive-based policies to achieve universal broadband, both wired and wireless. Through the Commission's Broadband Acceleration Initiative, the Chairman has advanced policies that reduce cost and time required to deploy broadband infrastructure, including streamlining the process for attaching communications equipment to utility poles and wireless towers. The agency has taken strong steps to preserve internet freedom and openness, adopting a framework to protect free enterprise and free speech online, incentivizing significant private investment in internet applications and services, as well as broadband networks and infrastructure. Today, Chairman Janikowski is going to outline in a major policy address where we as a country can go from here. As a company that has been, op that has been built on open access to a fast and secure internet, Vox Media is proud to welcome Chairman Julius Janikowski. Jim, thank you so much for, uh, for that great introduction and for reminding me of what was really just such a fun uh, time in our lives. And uh, uh, it's great to be back. It's great to be back. I don't know what you all were doing last night. Um, I was watching Monday Night Football, <laughs> and I, I fell asleep. Did I miss anything? <laughs> wow. Uh, I thought the FCC got a lot of complaints about drop calls. <laughs> anyway, seriously, uh, Jim, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to Vox Media for, for hosting this. Uh, I know it's a big day. You're relaunching SB Nation and that you took the time uh, uh, to host this, that uh, so many of you are here uh, uh, listening to some points about policy. I appreciate it very much. And all of you should know, uh, Jim Bankoff has established himself as one of the great innovators in online media. Seizing the opportunities of the internet, SB Nation has grown a network of more than 1,000 contributors in 49 states. And the public has responded to this localized content, making SB Nation the fastest growing sports website in America, with more than 28 million monthly visitors. Now, many of those SB Nation contributors started as commenters, and 99% are paid. So SB Nation, much like eBay and Amazon, Facebook and Google, serves as a platform for entrepreneurial people all over America to create value online and make a living. So when you think about SB Nation, just like when you think about these other companies, it's not just the hundreds of jobs that Jim Bankoff and his team have created at Vox Media. It's the platform for other work and job creation. It's part of the hidden story of what the broadband revolution uh, can do for our economy. And one of the reasons I'm really happy to be here is that this company is a perfect example of it. 
Uh, of course, SB Nation uh, is far from all that, uh, that Vox Media is doing. The Verge uh, is uh, the country's fastest growing tech news site. Polygon is taking on gaming. And I have a feeling that Jim and the Vox Media team aren't done yet. Now, about this time a year ago, I delivered a speech uh, just down the road at Living Social, a pioneer in the daily deals category that's provided value to consumers and small businesses while in a similar way creating hundreds and hundreds of US jobs. I chose to speak there for basically the same reason that I'm speaking here at Box Media, to illustrate that broadband, high-speed internet, wired and wireless, is transforming our economy and the way we live for the better. I'll speak today about how, over the past four years, the US has regained global leadership in key areas of the broadband economy and is building a strong foundation for the future. But as important, I want to talk about how we also face significant challenges, some familiar and some new. Most notably, we're in a global bandwidth race. This race will help determine who creates jobs and grows GDP in this flat, competitive, innovation-driven global economy. Now and over the next decade, US leadership will require a strategic bandwidth advantage. Fast, high capacity, and ubiquitous broadband. To secure this advantage for our country, the private and public sectors both have important roles. Seizing the opportunities of big bandwidth will bring enormous benefits, and failure to do so will have real and negative consequences. Now, I'll, I'll try to keep my remarks here uh, brief, at least brief by policy speech uh, standards, uh, a longer version that elaborates on some of the points that I'll make uh, will be available at FCC.gov. And I encourage you to go to FCC.gov anyway and learn about what we're doing. So let's start with the good news. Our increasingly knowledge-based economy is powered by broadband. And our broadband economy and its foundation have come a long way in the past four years, both in absolute terms and relative to our global competitors. It wasn't long ago that Asia and Europe were ahead of the US in broadband-powered innovation and infrastructure. Take mobile. In 2008, Business Week described America as having been a wireless backwater. We were talking then about Europe's lead on 3G and about the vibrant mobile innovation in countries like Japan and South Korea. But thanks to innovative American companies, software, mobile, broadband providers, and others, and to smart government policies. The story today is different. It's one of comeback and leadership. After trailing in key 3G metrics, we're now leading the world in deploying the next generation of wireless broadband networks, 4G LTE, at scale. Today, we have 69% of the world's LTE subscribers and every expectation to maintain 4G leadership for the foreseeable future. The United States has become the global testbed for LTE apps and services. America is leading, too, in the software-driven apps and services running on these networks. More than 80% of smartphones sold today throughout the world run on operating systems developed by US companies. That's up from less than 25% three years ago, an amazing shift. And US companies are the clear leaders in the tablet sector worldwide, accounting for roughly three quarters of tablets sold and for the operating systems on almost all tablets. The explosion of tablet use is just incredible. The percentage of American adults using tablets and e-readers has leapt from 2% to 30% in just three years. Today's smartphone and tablet-powered apps economy, already massive, but still in the early innings, is fundamentally a made in the USA phenomenon and a very recent one. In June 2008, there was no app store. In June 2012, the Apple and Android app stores alone had collective 3 billion downloads. It's 100 million apps a day. On wired broadband infrastructure, we've made major progress too. At the beginning of 2009, broadband networks capable of 100 megabits per second passed less than 20% of US homes. That number is over 80% today, putting the US, for the moment, near the top of the world in deployment of high-speed broadband infrastructure. 
And according to Akamai's latest State of the Internet report, the average speeds actually used in the U.S. are up almost 30 percent in just one year from 2011 to 2012. Now, smartphones and tablets require both wireless and wired infrastructure. Without Wi-Fi, smartphones and tablets would have far less value, and Wi-Fi wouldn't have been possible without a, and Wi-Fi wouldn't be possible without a wired broadband infrastructure, as well as FCC policies that enabled Wi-Fi use on unlicensed spectrum. Wi-Fi now drives over 40 percent of mobile internet connections and over 92 percent of tablet internet connections in the U.S. What some people call heterogeneous, net, heterogeneous networks, wired and wireless broadband, are powering other key growth industries like cloud computing. With firms like Amazon, Apple, Google, Rackspace, Box, and others, the U.S. pioneered and continues to lead the fast-growing cloud computing industry, delivering real benefits to businesses and consumers. So broadband is an essential platform for job creation and investment, and we can see that in what's happened over the last several years. Mobile innovation is estimated to have created 1.6 million U.S. jobs over the past five years. And the nascent apps economy has already created nearly 500,000 U.S. jobs. Companies delivering cloud services added 80,000 new jobs in 2010, not counting the many jobs they helped create by boosting productivity and lowering costs for businesses large and small. From 2009 to 2011, Annual investment in wired and wireless networks increased about 30 percent to more than $60 billion, even in this challenging economy. This wave of broadband-related investment and innovation in the U.S. over the past few years is just the beginning. The benefits for education, for health care, energy, and public safety are all proving themselves out right now through amazing inventors and entrepreneurs. Now, I'm pleased that a reinvigorated FCC has been part of this positive story. The FCC has helped lay a foundation for success by modernizing rules for the broadband age and ensuring a climate for investment and innovation throughout the broadband ecosystem. We developed America's first national broadband plan, transformed an outdated universal service program that was telephone-oriented into the Connect America Fund, the largest U.S. broadband infrastructure program ever. We've unleashed licensed and unlicensed spectrum for mobile innovation, removed regulatory barriers to lower the cost of broadband deployment, enacted a strong common sense framework to preserve internet freedom and openness, and taken strong steps to protect competition. Of course, the country's work is not done. Progress in broadband over the past four years is real and significant, but we shouldn't declare victory, not in this fast-moving and globally competitive sector. Challenges to U.S. leadership are real. Some of these challenges are a consequence of our own success. The Internet is an American invention, and whether it's Google or Facebook, Netflix or Hulu, Amazon or eBay, Twitter or Dropbox, the examples are endless. American innovators have driven dramatic increases in demand for broadband, whether mobile or at home, work or school. This rush of demand is creating real challenges, real challenges to the broadband infrastructure and to other broadband policies. Well, bring it on. These are the kinds of challenges America wants to have. Too much demand is much better than too little. And these are the kinds of challenges we can meet and overcome. Now, in general, the challenges to U.S. leadership in the broadband economy come from technology-powered developments. This is a flat world where capital can flow and innovators can work anywhere. And in this 24-7 information world, it's no secret anywhere that broadband is a ticket to a country's economic success. I've met with senior government officials and business leaders throughout the world, and I can tell you that they are all focused on the broadband opportunity whether it's Korea, China, the EU, Australia, on and on, all have plans to deploy ultra-high-speed broadband on a wide scale to become a magnet for innovators and capital. We are in a global bandwidth race. A nation's future economic security is tied to frictionless and speedy access to information. The faster we can connect our citizens, the faster our economy can grow. The more people of all walks of life that have access to bandwidth, the more opportunity we spread for all. And much like the space race in the 20th century, 
Success in this race will unleash waves of innovation that will go a long way toward determining who leads our global economy in the 21st century. Now, U.S. leadership in internet innovation, wired and wireless, starts with our remarkable innovators and entrepreneurs. It's why it's so important that we have world-class education in the United States and smart immigration policies like Senator Schumer's new bill to make more green cards available to foreign graduates of U.S. universities with advanced math, science, and engineering degrees. World-leading talent in the U.S. is necessary, but it's not sufficient. We also need world-leading digital infrastructure. Our challenge is to ensure that the U.S. has a strategic bandwidth advantage. This is a point first made by the architect of our national broadband plan, Blair Levin, and Tom Friedman has written persuasively on this as well. What do I see as the elements of developing a strategic bandwidth advantage? I see three key pieces. Broadband speed, capacity, and ubiquity. We need people to have the bandwidth they need when and where they need it, whether you're a high-tech innovator, large or small business, or a consumer at home or on the go. Now, let me describe what I mean by speed, capacity, and ubiquity, and why each is important. And let me suggest what a broadband ecosystem with these three elements will require. So start with faster speeds. Speed matters because innovators need next generation speed for next generation innovations. Genetic sequencing for cancer patients, immersive and creative software to help children learn, ways for small businesses to take advantage of big data. And speed and capacity heavy innovations we can't even imagine. Businesses and consumers need high speeds to take advantage of services like cloud computing every day. These can make every smartphone, tablet, and laptop capable of harnessing the power of the world's largest supercomputers and capable of accessing the petabytes of vast data centers. As President Obama has said, to lead the world to a new future of productivity and prosperity, we have to connect all of America to 21st century infrastructure and raise the standards for broadband speed. More capacity. We're experiencing a revolution in how we consume and generate data. The internet used to be a text-heavy website on a computer screen. Today it's streaming video on your TV set, your smartphone, your tablet, video conferencing, telework, cloud storage, and more. Look at SB Nation. Most of its uh, content, when it got off the ground, I remember this very well, was static text, a few pictures on a network of blogs. That was then. Today, more and more SB Nation is creating high bandwidth, valuable video content. Across all of Vox Media sites, the number of videos being posted is up 1,200% over the past year. This explosion of online video and other high bandwidth applications and services leading internet users to consume more and more data every month. To maximize the opportunities of broadband for our economy, Consumers need sufficient monthly broadband capacity to make e-commerce routine and unconstrained. To maximize the opportunities of broadband for education, healthcare, and other important national priorities, consumers need sufficient monthly broadband capacity so that families with school-aged children won't have to fight over who gets to use the internet for homework. A distance learner can take a full course load online. A senior with diabetes can have regular online video consultations with a doctor in another town. Ubiquity. By ubiquity, I mean this. Broadband should be available to everyone, anywhere, anytime. This means that our fastest, latest wireless broadband networks should cover at least 98% of the country as the president set as a goal, that no American should be without a broadband option, and that we must change the fact that nearly one in three Americans remain unconnected at home. The phrase universal broadband is often used to cover these concepts, and it's a good phrase. I'm using ubiquity today to emphasize the increasing importance of mobile broadband. What's the goal in focusing on speed, capacity, and ubiquity? The goal is removing bandwidth and location as constraints on innovation. Let me be more concrete on the vision. 
First, as we said in our national broadband plan, we need innovation hubs in the US with ultra-fast broadband, with speed measured in gigabits, not megabits. There have been some positive developments on this front in Kansas City. Google has now launched the first large-scale commercial effort to bring one gigabit per second service to a residential market. In Chattanooga, Tennessee, the community-owned utility installed 100% fiber to the premises network, making speeds up to one gigabit per second available to all residences, businesses, and institutions. And the GigU initiative led by Blair Levin has already catalyzed over $200 million in private investment to build ultra-high speed hubs in the communities of many leading research universities. These efforts provide essential test beds for developing and testing the data-rich technologies of our future. But we need more innovation hubs than we can count on one hand. We need a critical mass of communities that have the most robust bandwidth in the world, where broadband abundance is a fact of life, so that private sector innovators and the research community can invent and test tomorrow's essential services with a meaningful number of potential users. Now, second, we need to ensure that truly high-speed, high-capacity broadband plans are the norm widely, not the exception. In the National Broadband Plan, we set a goal of affordable 100 megabit per second service to 100 million Americans, to 100 million households by 2020. We set this goal so that America in 2020 would have the largest market in the world for high-speed broadband. Now, we've made significant progress toward that goal, but we need to get faster sooner. Many of today's services already depend or thrive at those speeds, video conferencing and cloud services, for example, particularly when there are multiple users in a home or business. Without a mass market to consume those services in the US, we risk innovators, startups, and established companies looking elsewhere. Now, third, we need to make sure that even the hardest to reach areas of our country and the least advantaged among us share in the benefits of broadband as each new wave of applications moves from novelty to necessity. All Americans should have access to a network that provides a baseline of service sufficient to connect them to our modern economy and to education, healthcare, and public safety resources. And fourth, we need to build on our global lead in the deployment of 4G wireless networks and keep pushing to make sure we're the first in 5G and beyond. Not only is this vital to meet the nation's exploding mobile broadband demand, but it's the only way we'll remain a world leader in mobile innovation. We have our work cut out for us, and despite America's broadband resurgence, here are a few key reasons we can't let up. Consider the evolution of competition-driven upgrades to our wireline networks over the past two decades. We've gone from DOCSIS to uh, uh, DSL and more, we need the upgrade cycle to continue, which raises important questions. Who will push the next round of upgrades and when? How can we ensure that we see the network upgrades our innovation economy needs? Now, despite the significant improvements in US broadband infrastructure, the average speeds that Americans actually use appear to lag those in some other countries, including Korea and Japan. So whether it's because higher speed services here are more expensive or for other reasons, Americans aren't adopting high-speed services as fast as some of our global competitors. And roughly 30% of Americans are still not connected to home broadband at all. In mobile, we face additional challenges. US mobile data traffic grew almost 300% last year, and driven by 4G LTE smartphones and tablets, traffic is projected to grow an additional 16-fold by 2016. With this exponential growth, demand for our wireless capacity is on pace to exceed supply even with significant new spectrum coming online. Congested networks are slower networks. So what can our country do to meet these challenges to have a strategic broad, uh, ba uh, bandwidth advantage? We must drive massive private investment in both networks and applications, a virtuous cycle where innovative applications drive user demand for bandwidth, which generates returns and incentives for network providers to invest in speed, capacity, and ubiquity, which in turn enables further innovation, more demand, more network investment, and on we go. Some say government has no role to play here. Government should just eliminate existing rules and policies on its way out the door. Now, as someone who spent more than a decade in the private sector and believes fundamentally 
in the power of the free market, I disagree with that view. We don't have to choose between having broadband policies that drive global leadership and believing in a free market. It's a false choice. A smart broadband policy puts a well-functioning free market with healthy competition as a core objective. Government has a role to play, limited but vital. Light touch, not no touch. When it comes to promoting fast, high capacity, and ubiquitous broadband networks, there are three key areas where the FCC should act. First, we need to keep driving improvements in broadband infrastructure and accessibility. We need to continue removing barriers to broadband build out, lowering the cost of infrastructure deployment. Spectrum, which the FCC manages, is our invisible infrastructure. And we need to address the spectrum crunch both by unleashing more airwaves for broadband and significantly increasing the efficiency of spectrum use by moving forward on sharing and small cell technologies. We're also moving forward with a major policy innovation called incentive auctions to move spectrum from over the air broadcasting to mobile broadband. These are all parts of the solution and parts of what government needs to do. And we need to continue to implement programs like the Connect America Fund and broadband adoption efforts for low-income Americans that will help ensure that no one is cut off from the broadband economy wherever they live. Second, we need to protect and promote competition. Competition is the lifeblood of our free market economy, driving private investment, innovation, and consumer value. The more competition, the less need for regulation. We know from decades of experience that when it comes to competition in the communication sector, the FCC needs to be a cop on the beat. This means continuing to fairly and rigorously review all transactions that come before us, distinguishing between efficiency enhancing deals that serve the public interest and should be approved without issue, and those that threaten harm to competition and consumers. It means an obligation to consider all options, divestitures, blocking deals, and imposing conditions. And it means vigorously enforcing conditions on transactions so companies can't flout or work around their obligations. It means that when the data shows that our rules no longer reflect the competitive landscape or aren't serving their intended purpose, we need to be willing to take a fresh look based on the best data about the state of the market and act to preserve competition. Promoting competition also means we need to keep a close eye on developments in places like Kansas City to see what additional steps federal, state, and local governments can take to encourage game-changing investments by disruptive new broadband competitors. We need to increase transparency, which helps make markets work more efficiently. And although there isn't unanimous agreement on this point, and others I've mentioned at the FCC, protecting competition sometimes means putting rules in place to prevent anti-competitive practices. Rules we adopted last year by majority vote to ensure broadband data roaming is one example. Now, of course, government bodies, including state and local agencies, must do their part too, encouraging competition and innovation and certainly not erecting roadblocks. There's a debate right now in the news here in Washington, DC, on rules that could discourage the innovative on-demand car, car service company, Uber. Not hard to guess which side I'm on. I'm on the side of innovation. To be clear. Competition is vital throughout the broadband economy, not just for communications networks, but the commission focuses primarily on these networks, so that's where I focused my remarks. And third, and related, we need to preserve open platforms. It's the internet's openness and freedom, the ability to speak, innovate, and engage in commerce and free enterprise without having to ask for anyone's permission that's enabled its unparalleled success. It's why we adopted common sense rules of the road to preserve a free and open internet and to foster the virtuous cycle of massive investment in both edge and the core of broadband networks. These rules, which we adopted two years ago, have increased certainty and predictability for innovators and investors throughout the space. And in fact, in the two years since the FCC adopted our open internet framework, investment has increased, innovation has increased, throughout the broadband economy, at the edge and at the core. We're also fighting to protect the internet as an engine of innovation and free expression internationally. In the context of UN negotiations, which will come to a head at the end of this year, some countries are proposing to fundamentally change the way the internet works and impose a new layer 
of international control on the free flow of information and data online. These kinds of growth-killing proposals must be rejected. So yes, we've made a ton of progress in the United States, but the threats and challenges are very real. We can't be satisfied with where we are. We have to keep focusing on speed, capacity, and ubiquity, and take the necessary steps to ensure a strategic bandwidth advantage for the US in the 21st century. We have to keep looking over our shoulders at what other parts of the world are doing and keep asking ourselves the big questions, like, is our broadband infrastructure providing a strategic bandwidth advantage? Are we winning the global bandwidth race? Are we delivering to the country broadband performance that's the envy of the world? If we keep the pedal to the floor, including through smart government policies, we can ensure we have the innovation infrastructure we need to preserve and extend US leadership in the global broadband economy. In that world, we all win. Broadband applications and service companies, broadband network companies, our economy, and all consumers. Working together, we can do this. Thank you. This, this is the transition? This is the transition. So um, for those of you who are watching the live stream, bear with us for probably no more than 90 seconds or so while we make a quick stage transition here. And we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone who's out the live stream. So we only have a short period of time, but we wanted to make sure that we got to some questions. I'll ask something, and then Eli is going to ask questions that came directly from the audience at The Verge, www.theverge.com, if you want to follow along. Um, Chairman, thank you. Um, your speech and, and vision for broadband and our policy in America is inspired. and. Um, as I think you know, coming here, you're, you're preaching not only to the converted, <laughs> but to the rapidly converted. Uh, and so we want to help. Um, and I think most of the people who are watching on the stream want to help as well. Um, it's an election year. Uh, it's one of those few opportunities that we as citizens have to make a big difference with our vote and our other actions. Um, what, what we're trying to figure out is, at least from my perspective, I hear what you're saying and I think, gosh, it's great for all Americans. And you know, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, your interest is growing our economy and putting people to work and taking a leadership position in a growth area. 
So my question is for you is, who's against it? <laughs> and, um, and what do we do to help persuade those who are against it? I'll call them the bad people to frame it, <laughs> to frame it in a negative. But what, what can we do as, as citizens who believe in this to, to advance this agenda? Well, let me, the, the, the first point I'd make is that um, uh, I think the largest enemy is indifference. It's not believing that issues around our broadband infrastructure really matter to our economy, to education, to healthcare. And indifference is an insidious enemy. So how do you combat indifference? Don't be indifferent. And, and what does that mean? I mean, it, one, it means uh, uh, get engaged. One of the things that I'm proud that we did at the FCC was we really opened it up to um, input from people wherever they are. Right In the old days, if you wanted to have input at the FCC, you had to hire a lawyer, have them write down some stuff on a filing, file it, and someone would read it, maybe. Uh, everything we do now is live online. Uh, everyone on the outside can have input into our proceedings. People can have input as in individuals, whether they're innovators, um, uh, whether they're people at universities, et cetera. They can do it as individuals, or they can band together as people do and say, hey, we, we have a view. That stuff matters. The other thing I'd say is um, ideas matter. And we've got some great ideas over the last few years from people on the outside who use the channel to say, hey, listen, you've been talking about this problem. You know, um, uh, uh, you, you want to see more innovation hubs in the US. Well, why don't you think about this? So be engaged and combat indifference is, I think, my main message. Yeah. Mm. Ask some questions from our Verge audience. Yeah, I know, uh, I know they. I know they didn't pull any punches. They did not pull any punches. <laughs> so the, the 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 number one question that we've gotten, um, you know, the iPhone five just came out. Hmm. It's a big deal. Along with it, Apple released iOS six, which for the first time enables you to make FaceTime calls over cellular. Uh, now the only major restriction on mobile carriers with your open internet rules is that they're not allowed to block other voice and video calling services. But AT&T has blocked FaceTime on iOS 6, FaceTime over cellular on iOS 6, unless you get a new plan. Uh, and the readers, they all want to know. I mean, do you think this is a violation of your open internet rules? Is, are they found a loophole? What, what's your take? Well, this is, you know, we're going to continue to have disputes and issues that arise under open internet framework. Uh, uh, this is one that could very well come before us in a formal way. So. Uh, I shouldn't comment on specifically. Filed, right? uh, I, I think there are reports that there may be a formal complaint filed. But let me, let me make a couple of general points. One is um, the best way to resolve uh, disputes over how uh, the internet should continue to roll out mm -hmm. is through discussion and multi-stakeholder forums. and trying to uh, do the thing that the internet has done many times, many, many, very successfully. We adopted the open internet rules because that doesn't always lead to success. And sometimes good faith efforts uh, don't resolve things. Many times they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, uh, I encourage that process. If it doesn't lead to a resolution and a complaint is filed, we will exercise our responsibilities and we will act. Okay. Does that mean? Do you, are you OK with AT&T blocking? As, as I said, it may come before us as something we have to make a decision. We have obligations to make decisions on a record, based on input, on all the facts. Uh, so, uh, so I just can't comment on a specific, on a specific thing. But we're going to do our job, as we've proven um, in the past and other situations where uh, complaints have come before us. And we've resolved them. And we've made the tough decisions. Sure. OK. So the next two questions from our readers. Uh, it's actually two questions, I think, is, is really one question. I think it's really interesting. Uh, so this one is from uh, C. Westfa. Uh, this is, let me ask both questions first. Does the FCC intend to start making progress on requiring network interoperability, seamless roaming, and devices that can be unlocked to work in any carrier? The second part of the question is from uh, Greasy Taco Aficionado, who is one of our, <laughs> one of our best commenters, actually. Uh, how are Apple's competitors supposed to compete when carriers don't allow them to sell the same phone design on multiple carriers, uh, thereby not getting the brand recognition and economies of scale that go along with selling more of a single phone. So uh, a couple of points. One is you know, what we've seen in the mobile marketplace in the last four years is probably unlike any business revolution, any consumer and business revolution that we've ever seen. You know, In four years, to go from a world of uh, 
the feature phones we used to have to iPhones and Android phones and to tablets, like it's just amazing. Um, making sure that you know in this world we also keep our eye on a couple of balls, competition and consumers is important. And um, uh, so issues like interoperability are issues that we look at. Uh, there is an issue with uh, some competing mobile carriers not being able to access devices. Now, that issue is less of an issue than it was um, uh, uh, when the iPhone was first introduced. And you can get the iPhone on more and more carriers now. Mm -hmm. Another issue that uh, we certainly pay attention to and that we acted on uh, is broadband data roaming. So just a very quick story here. You know, we've, um, there was a, uh, an issue that came up in the, pre in the voice era about whether um, uh, consumers had a right to expect that their phones would be able to roam on other networks. This is really important for competition because consumers don't want phones that only work some places and not other places. And there are many challenges to having multiple providers build out infrastructure everywhere. Uh, so voice roaming rules uh, were in place. But when I got to the FCC, data roaming rules were not. And we took that up, and we looked at it, and we said, you know what? It's really the same issue. Uh, consumers expect national roaming. Not all competitors can have the infrastructure. And we need to adopt these rules to make sure there's broadband data roaming for competitors and consumers. Um, I don't understand to this day why that wasn't a unanimous vote. But it wasn't. And we have to keep on working hard to explain why it's needed, why it's an appropriate role for government, how it fosters competition, uh, protects consumers, and ultimately drives the innovation and investment that comes from a competitive market. So uh, just to follow up on this, from my perspective, it seems like having slightly more regulation on the network side of things enables an enormous amount of competition on the devices and services side. I mean, that's our company. That's this device. Uh, do you share that view? I mean, do you, do you think there's a room for kind of more regulation, the interoperability, standard setting side, sort of on the network layer? Well, you know, we've been very focused on exactly the point that you're raising, which is uh, how do we ensure uh, this vibrant, uh, internet-based innovation uh, that we've seen. And there's just no question, that it's really not disputable that the uh, open nature uh, of the internet has just played a critical role. I, you know, I, 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 I watched this company as it was founded. Uh, and so, um, uh, so yes, you know, uh, uh, sometimes government has to act to preserve platforms for innovation. That's what the open internet net neutrality debate was all about. Uh, uh, doing it in a smart, market-oriented way that recognizes the realities of the marketplace, the fact that we really want an open platform for innovators, and we also really want robust, fast networks that require capital investment. It drives you to uh, um, uh, policy solutions that recognize the importance of both. One of the things I'm proud of is that we were able to do the open internet rules in a way that, uh, and, you know, the facts just prove this out over the last two years, have contributed to this virtual cycle. Um, more innovation, more demand for consumers, uh, more incentive for network companies to invest in wired and wireless infrastructure, faster speeds, more innovation. Part of what I'm saying today is uh, that's a great cycle. We need to speed it up uh, even more. We need more speed, more capacity, and we need to get to ubiquity. Well, I think our time is unfortunately coming to a close, but thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your service. Thank you for coming here today to <laughs> share this plan with us. And I think uh, we all hear the message loud and clear that we have to become active if this vision is really going to continue, and we can't take for granted the foundation that companies like Vox Media and so many other great American companies have been built upon. So we will fight, and we'll work together to get it done. Um, for those of you who are watching the live stream, obviously go to FCC.gov to get involved, to learn more about what Chairman Jenikowski 
is working on and how you can become informed and part of the broadband initiatives here. Um, and of course, please come to theverge.com where Neelai and his merry group of commenters will also engage in a lively discussion. Um, thank you everyone who attended. Thank you everyone who was on the stream. Have a great day. Thanks. Congratulations on, uh, on what you built. Thank you, Thank you for doing this.